Welcome back to Elements of Worship. We've been talking about giving and offerings, and uh, we talked about, last week, we talked about the Old Testament precursors, tithes, and free will offerings, and kind of ended with David's um, prayer at the, the at the coronation of Solomon and receiving all of the gifts and offerings for the temple, and we talked some about the theology of giving involved in that prayer, and today we are moving on to the New Testament. And um, as I was thinking about this, I realized that like, there's really two places we're going to focus, especially. Um, and one is Luke Acts. Um, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but Luke and Acts are written by the same person. They're both written by Luke. And so you can kind of think about them as two volumes of one work, even though they you know, are not next to each other in our, the order of books in the Bible. You can kind of put them together. And so Luke Acts has a lot to say about poverty and wealth, and therefore, not surprisingly, has a lot to say about giving. And then we're going to look at Paul's letters as well, which also have a lot to say about giving. Um, but let's jump into Luke. Uh, Luke has a couple of references to tithing, um, both of them associated with the Pharisees. So, for instance, in Luke eleven forty two, 42, Jesus says, But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint, rue, and every herb, but you pass by justice and the love of God. But it is necessary to do these things without overlooking those. Um, so the Pharisees are tithing their mint, rue, and every herb. Now, I, we mentioned last week that the tithe very specifically applies to agricultural produce, whether that's crops or animals. So just to be clear, if you were um, being paid a wage for doing some sort of work, you didn't tithe that. It was the people who own fields and cattle and stuff would, would tithe um, from those. So the picture we have here is, you know, you've got your little herb box <laughs> out on the back of your house. Maybe you're not even a subsistence farmer, but you've just got like you're, grow you're growing some mint out back. Um, to use for your, you know, your own cooking. And the Pharisees here are so stringent in their tithe that even these like little herbs that they're growing out, you know, in, in, in the herb patch are, are being tithed, everything. Um, so quite a close, detailed observance of the law here. But um, while they're so focused on that, they, they miss, they pass by justice and the love of God. And of course, this is kind of part and parcel of a, uh, uh, the whole critique Jesus has of the Pharisees, which is that they get very fixated on obeying certain letters of the law, but they miss the purpose of the law. They miss God's heart in the law. And so uh, they miss what Jesus calls the weightier matters of the law elsewhere. And these are divided into two. I think one maybe horizontal, one vertical. Justice are obligations to um, give uh, what is due to our fellow human beings and then love of God. So your actual heart relationship towards God. So once again, like a lot of the things involving the Pharisees, we see a focus on externals that we get our, you know, one tenth of every single little thing that's produced. And what we're missing is, um, has a lot to do with the heart, with, with our love for God, and then also our conduct towards fellow human beings. We see the same sort of thing come back again in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And just if, to, if you don't remember that, it's Jesus tells this story about this Pharisee who prays this very theologically expansive prayer. And then this tax collector, who obviously is already starting from behind because he is a tax collector and therefore probably guilty of exploiting the poor for profit. And but he can't even look up to heaven and just says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And the surprise result is that the tax collector is justified, but the Pharisee is not. Um, in among this whole prayer, which is, which is very interesting to look at in detail as a negative example Jesus is using of how people are relating to God, um, one that seems very pious but isn't, um, we find, I fast twice a week, I tithe everything I acquire. So tithing is right there among the kind of central observances that the Pharisee thinks are going to justify himself before God. Luke um, heads this parable by saying that Jesus told this parable to people who are trying to, who thought that they could justify themselves. So um, I read everything in the Pharisee's prayer about 
Um, the, his, his, the way he's obeying God's law is about justifying himself. And one of those things is tithing, that he, he tithing has become a means of justifying himself before God. Um, so that's the, those, those are the two references to tithing in Luke. And both of them, interestingly, seem to be negative. No, I mean, not that Jesus is saying it's wrong to tithe, but in both cases, tithing had become a focus of self-righteousness is something that's distracting from other areas of the law. So if we're in Luke 18, we go from the Pharisee, of the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. We then, as we're moving through Luke, we bump into the, what this rich ruler, this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and asks him, you know, good teacher, you know, what message do you be saved? And he makes this claim that he's obeyed the law of Moses from his youth. And this is how Jesus responds. Hearing this, Jesus said to him, you yet lack one thing, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. So this is actually rather striking, especially given that we've just had one of our references to tithing. Um, Jesus, get, and I, I mean, I assume that this rich young ruler, he says he's followed the entire law. I assume this is tithing, you know, we've, we've kind of, uh, limited his um you know he's 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 done his up to 10 percent giving he's good to go and the way jesus needles and challenges this rich young ruler is he says he you lack one thing sell everything you have and give it to the poor and of course the rich young ruler is unable to do this he's very wealthy and he's unable to give up his money it's certainly a difficult challenge i wonder how many of us <laughs> would be able to uh to, to do this if Jesus asked it of us. Um, but that's what Jesus says, give it all up and follow me. And the man is unable to do it. Um, so we go straight from this tithing example, the Pharisee, we go into this, this person who, because of his wealth um, and because of the connection he has to his wealth, even though he sincerely has tried to keep the law his whole life, he is unable to really follow Jesus. Then in the next chapter, we meet a tax collector you know, we've had the Pharisee, parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. We meet this rich young ruler and we go into the next chapter. We meet this tax collector named Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus' story, uh, you know, maybe you know the story. Zacchaeus is a wee little man. He's, he's short. He climbs up the tree to see Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Um, and it's one of these really interesting examples of gospel change in the Bible, because all Jesus does is say, I'm coming to your house. And he comes to Zacchaeus's house. He shows grace to Zacchaeus, um, uh, blesses Zacchaeus with, you know, his presence, honors Zacchaeus, despite the fact that Zacchaeus is a sinner, is a tax collector. Um, and I, you know, I thought, I thought about a bit recently about like, what, what is the analog for a tax collector? And I really think it is an, an oppressive business person. These are people of high social status. They're, they're pretty socially powerful, um, but they're also people that everybody would recognize um, are, are, are exploiting and damaging poor people, and their wealth comes from a place of exploitation. Um, so if you want to frame it that way, you know, Jesus says to one of those, honors one of those people with his presence. Um, and this experience changes Zacchaeus. Um, it says, then Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, look, Half of my possessions, Lord, I hereby give to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I will give back fourfold. There's two set things, two uh, parts to what Zacchaeus is saying here. First of all, if he's anything he's extorted, he's going to give back fourfold, which is attempts to follow the law of restitution set out by Moses about what you should do if you've stolen something from somebody. Um, but beyond that, he's also going to give half of his possessions to the poor. Um, and it, it, it's so interesting. In this case, it, it's um, it's a very different setup. He, Jesus hasn't commanded Zacchaeus to give away anything, like he commanded the rich young ruler. And yet, and Zacchaeus also doesn't give away a tithe. He gives, he's given away half of his possessions, fully 50%, purely spontaneously without Jesus asking him to do this. This is just simply an immediate impact of the gospel in Zacchaeus's life, is that he generously gives away half of his possessions. Um, well, let's continue the story into Acts, um, uh, the, the, the story of, of giving, um, because there's a big emphasis in the, this new church that Jesus has founded. Giving is, seems to play a central role. It's right there in Acts 4 with some of the other things 
that we saw are typical of the church. So here's Acts 4. And the multitude of those who believed were one heart and soul, and there was no one who said that his possessions belonged to him privately, but all things were common to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon all of them. For there was no one needy among them, for such as owned land or houses were selling them and bringing the proceeds of the sales and placing them at the apostles' feet. And the proceeds were distributed to each as he had need. Okay, so we've got this, the, the classic communist passage. Uh, we should probably clarify um, that uh, this is not an abolition of private property. It's not as if nobody was allowed to own anything. There do seem to have been possibly examples of Jewish groups that required a, um, a forfeit of all property to the group, to the, to the community as a condition of joining. This doesn't, but that doesn't seem like what's happening here, like that the apostles are saying, if you want to be a member of this new movement, you, you have to give over all your stuff. Um, I think with the strong language of holding things in common, it's important to like mention this might not be what we're, what we're thinking about with other forms of religious or non-religious communism that have come into existence throughout history. All that said, um, and I think why that's important is because of the freedom, like the sense in which people are freely giving this stuff. All that said, there is a sense in which people are no longer regarding their private property as belonging to them privately, but they're seeing it as fundamentally in disposal towards what's common to everybody. So there's a mentality here that is not, well, it's my private property, so get off my case. I'm going to do with it what I want. There's an attitude of, um, I don't even think of my possessions as belonging to myself, they're for everybody else. And we can hear some of these echoes of um, David's prayer, right? That everything we own is given to us by God, and therefore I don't think of it even as really my private possessions. I think of it as something that is there to be provide for the needs of any person within the community. Um, and it's said that at this point, like, there are no needy among them. So effective is this giving program. Um, and notice there's, there is kind of maybe a shade of a gathered worship sense of this, that like we're coming to where the apostles are gathered and placing the, these items at the apostles' feet. Um, of course, we're pre we're pre Act six. We have no deacons. So the apostles are just administering all of it at this point. But that sets us up for one of the more sobering stories in the book of Acts, and this is the next chapter, Acts five. I don't have the citation here, but um, that's the story of Ananias and Sapphira because this leads right into the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, sold a field, and he held some back from the price with his wife's knowledge, and he brought part and placed it at the feet of the apostles. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and hold back some from the price of the field? When it remained, didn't it belong to you? And when you sold it, wasn't it under your control? So why have you come up with this in your heart? You have not lied to humans, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell over and died, and great fear was upon all who heard. So this is a very sobering moment in this like wonderful, you know, beautiful picture of the early church here, where God's judgment falls upon Ananias in, in this act of giving. I think it's important to note why that's the case. Again, we don't have a situation here where selling and giving away all of your private property to the church is compulsory. In fact, the Ananias, the judgment on Ananias doesn't really seem to have to do with selling the field or not. And it seems to be like he could have just been fine if he hadn't sold the field. The issue is lying about it. The fact that, um, first of all, there's a division in his heart that he wants to get the credit for selling the field and giving it, but he also wants to hold part of it to himself. His heart is divided in his giving. Um, and so fundamental, and you know, uh, Peter mentions, what, why have you come up with this in your heart? The issue is a heart issue. The focus is not so much um, what percentage has he given the appropriate percentage? Has he given more or less than other people? The issue is the deceit and what Satan is doing in his heart um, in what happens here. Um, so again, we have emphasized in this very sobering episode something that we've seen already in Luke, um, that 
where your heart is, is very important and, and maybe is the, the crucial question in giving. Um, not just specifically exacting, making sure you give the right percentage and like the external focus, but like what is the heart behind your giving? Okay, so I mean, that's some uh, guidance from Luke Axe. Um, Paul adds a lot to our understanding as well. So, and, and a lot of these are uh, connected with Paul's collection from the Gentile churches for Jerusalem. Um, of course, the church in Jerusalem in the book of Acts, we learn, was persecuted. Um, and there seem to have been other reasons as well why um, there was uh, poverty and hunger among the church in Jerusalem. And uh, so Paul goes to going to all these Gentile churches, raises funds uh, to bring them to Jerusalem. And in the context of instructing the churches about this in his letters, he has a lot to say about the theology behind why we give. So this is Romans 15. But now I am going to Jerusalem serving the saints. That is the word like that is the verb for like that that is describes a deacon. But of course, that all Christians do, all Christians serve, and some are specifically set apart as deacons. But here it is serving the saints. Um, uh, this is this is this is the sort of thing that the deacons in 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 uh, Acts six are overseeing that sort of activity. For Macedonia and Achaia had been pleased to make a certain participation for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Participation here, we often translate this fellowship. Um, and uh, well, we'll come back to it as Paul's coming back to this in the next verse, but like there's some sense in which we are by our giving participating in uh, supplying their need for they were pleased and indeed they're obligated for if the Gentiles have participated in their spiritual things, they are obligated also to minister to them in material things. This is a very interesting theological point Paul is making. Again, this is participation. This is fellowship. And we talked about the Lord's Supper. We saw some of the, like, this is a very deep spiritual concept um, about how uh, we are fundamentally united to God and we receive life um, from God through the humanity of Christ as like a new humanity in which we participate. And that as we are united to God in Christ. We are united together, uh, and in the mystery of the Lord's Supper, we experience a special participation in Christ, which is also participation of fellowship with each other. And, and you know, we could talk a long time about the depth of the spiritual side of that. But what Paul makes really clear here is there's a material expression of this reality as well that's also important, that if we are participating spiritually with other believers in this way, then there's this obligation along with that to participate with them physically. In other words, our goods, our livelihoods are on the line when it comes to their need. Think of the body of Christ metaphor about how oh, the whole body cares if one part of the body is in need. Our being connected to other believers in this deep, profound spiritual way has very real um, uh, material um, implications. Uh, and so the big thing to take here is how this theme of participation or fellowship uh, is very much involved in our giving to each other as a church. Paul hits the same theme in 1 Corinthians as well. He says, and concerning the collection for the saints, just as I directed the churches in Galatia, so also you should do. On the first day of the week, each of you individually should set aside something, storing it up insofar as each may have been prospered, so that when I come, there will not need to be a collection. And when I am present, I will send whomever you have approved with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems good that I should, I also should go, they will go with me. So again, this is logistics here, but we, but notice, notice a very interesting detail that Paul says that they should be storing aside something um, on the first day of the week. Why the first day of the week? Well, I think some scholars have suggested very plausibly that uh, th this is because the collection is going to happen when they gather together in a special way for um, gathered worship on Sunday, on the Lord's Day. Um, some scholars have disputed that, but um, I think that's probably that's the most likely interpretation. So remember that under in the uh, Old Testament, gifts, offerings, giving, is in a very special way localized at the temple. It's one of the things that God's people come together in his presence to do, both for tithes and for free will offerings. Uh, and so I think it wouldn't be surprising to see Paul saying here that 
the, the significance of giving is something that fits especially appropriately in gathered worship, a way when we recognize God's lordship, when we recognize our gratitude to him by giving actually in the context of gathered worship. So this is a very important passage for um, why we would have gifts and offerings actually as an element in our worship service. Again, we do have the Old Testament parallel for that, um, but here we have a very specific New Testament anchoring ground as well. This is part of the early church's practice. Okay, so those are a couple mentions of giving in Paul, but the place where Paul really unpacks this doctrine is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, and we're going to hit the high points of it. Um, there's a lot here, and if you want to meditate more on giving as uh, and biblical teaching on giving, these two chapters would be highly recommended, and there's some stuff we can even learn from some of the logistics that I haven't put in the slides today about who's being sent and 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 and, and how they're to be approved. So we're, we are skipping some stuff in this chapter, but we're going to hit some of the main theological points. So let's start at the beginning of chapter eight. Now we make known to you, brothers and sisters, the grace of God, which has been given to the churches in Macedonia, that in many trials of tribulations, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty have abounded in the wealth of their simplicity. For I testify that they gave as, as they were able, and even beyond what they were able, willingly, begging us with much exhortation for the grace and participation of the service of the saints. And not merely as we had hoped, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and to us according to the will of God. So, Okay, and this is like Paul is very loaded. We have to unpack it a bit. Notice first that Paul refers to giving as a grace of God, um, like the ability to give and the way that you are blessed in giving is a gift of God. Um, again, echoes of David's theology here, that even our ability to give is something God has to put into our hearts and is a gift from him. Um, also notice the emphasis that the church in Macedonia is itself under trial and tribulation and that they give out of joy and deep, deep poverty, um, which is striking. I mean, I don't think, as we'll see later in the chapter, I don't think this means that the Macedonians, um, are, 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 are giving foolishly, but they're not wealthy. Um, they are, they, and, and it says they're giving as they're able and even beyond what they're able, like they are stretching their means in order to do this. And yet this is a way in which they're abounding in a spiritual wealth, you know, the wealth of their simplicity. If you caught my um, first, my not this month's evening devotional, but the one before we talked a bit about simplicity in James, almost all Bible translations, modern Bible translations put generosity instead of simplicity. But I always like to bring it back to this idea because it's really the idea of a, a, a whole heart, um, a sort of integrity and genuineness um, behind giving. Simplicity is wholeness of heart, not divided, not like Ananias and Sapphira, like having mixed motives or a dishonesty or a grudgingness in giving. Um, and so the Macedonians have experienced this grace of generosity and abundance, even though they're giving from a place of themselves not being particularly rich. Um, they give willingly, okay? Language of the free will offering used here that is given willingly and freely. Um, and even, they're even begging, like like desiring uh, that, um, that, they that they get the privilege. It's a privilege for them of the grace and participation of the service of the saints. Again, participation, fellowship, they are strongly desirous um, to... Uh, have fellowship with their fellow believers in this very material way. It's like, it's a privilege to them. They're like, please, Paul, like, let us do this. Um, so he, he didn't even have to urge them. He says, not merely as we hoped, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and to us according to the will of God. Okay, so they gave themselves. It's not like they themselves gave, but they gave themselves as in they were the thing that they gave. So this is, the, they first and foremost, like have given themselves to the Lord and to us. There's this kind of total dedication of themselves to God's service, which gives provides the background for their giving of the things they own. They're, they th consider themselves as a living sacrifice, to use language Paul uses elsewhere, to God. Um, and that is the, and then they're also therefore as a living sacrifice given for all of their brothers and sisters, for the apostles and all of their brothers and sisters. And so that actually forms a background of their giving this. Um, and so notice the focus here on the, the, 
where the Macedonian's heart is and how they're a model of giving uh, in a way that understands um, understands that they fully belong to God and want to fully give themselves over to God. And it's a blessing to give uh, and all of those sorts of things. Okay, so that's just the first five verses. We've got to keep going here. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and word and knowledge and all eagerness and the love from us, which is among you, you should abound also in this grace. I say this not as a command, but through the eagerness of others, I'm testing the genuineness of your own love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that on your behalf, he who was rich became poor, so that you might become rich by his poverty. Okay, a couple of other new important ideas here. First of all, Paul is exhorting them to abound in this grace as well. He puts it right alongside faith, uh, the word, knowledge, eagerness, love. This grace as well as something, a spiritual gift to seek to abound in. Um, and he says, I say it not as a command. That's interesting, right? It's an in uh, Maybe are we echoing, again, the free will offering? This isn't a tithe. This isn't a like, okay, 10% uh, or you're out. Um, this is, but rather, um, this is an opportunity of testing the genuineness of your own love through the eagerness of others. Um, so there's a, some sort of sense in which through the example of the Macedonians, they're being called into um, a, uh, uh, a, a, a exercise of gifting of their own, which is not something that we have like a command for, as in here's how much you should give, but is rather something that we are called to kind of press into and grow in. Um, I think we'll see a little bit more about what it means is not a command. Like Paul's going to go on to say it's beneficial. Like he's, he's giving them advice about how they can uh, benefit and grow and rejoice in God, not just simply a command. Uh, and then he points them to Jesus. So our giving expresses the way in which Jesus has given to us. Jesus was one who was rich and yet became poor in the incarnation so that we might become rich by his poverty. So Jesus' fundamental act of giving himself provides the basis out of which we give. And then he goes on, let me give you knowledge about this. I, I take this, by the way, to mean that when Paul says he's not giving you a com them a command, but he's giving them advice. Um, and he goes on to say, for this is beneficial for you. So the motivation structure is not just, here's God's command, I need to obey it, but rather here is a practice God has given us, which is beneficial for us. And so once I, if I understand that connection, if I understand how this is actually something that is good for me, a practice that benefits me, my motivation is not, I need to obey this command. My motivation is going to be, well, why wouldn't I do this? Um, it's, it, it, it's going to be one that comes from a very, uh, uh, a, a place of seeing the benefit for myself, like that this is something, this is this beautiful thing that will encourage and strengthen me. Uh, he goes on, is it beneficial for you that that which you began not only to do, but also to will a year ago? It's kind of like loaded Pauline language here, right? It's, it's very um, a little ponderous. But I think the point here is he wants to emphasize not just the action, but the will behind it. He goes, and he goes on to talk about the will, like what's going on inside of them. Now also to finish doing, so that just as was the inclination to will, so also the completion from what you have. For if the inclination is present, according to whatever one has, it is acceptable, not according to what one does not have. This is interesting. Paul's focusing us on the inclination and the will, what's going on inside. And uh, it's according to whatever one has. I notice like there's, I, we could have said this before with the Romans passage too, there's a real... Um, uh, global nature to this. It's important to Paul's theology that each person participate in giving. He's not just picking out the rich people and thinking, okay, I'm going to hit the big donors. You know, I could get a hundred of the little guys to give a little bit, but like, really, if I could just get one of, you know, if I could land a whale, <laughs> like a big donor, that would be worth like 500 of the look. Nope, that's not Paul's reasoning. Paul very much sees this as something that involves the whole body. And he's very concerned about the heart attitude and, and in encouraging the whole body to grow in it. And the heart attitude is almost, it, well, is more important than the means, right? Somebody who only has a little bit is only going to give a little bit. Somebody who has a lot may give a lot. 
but they may have a very similar inclination. And that's what Paul is zeroing in on there. What's going on in their hearts. Um, and he goes on to say, for it is not as if relief for others should come through your tribulation, but it is a matter of equality. So Paul is clarifying here that it's not um, simply a matter of them being uh, impoverished so that uh, others can prosper, um, but it's a matter of equality. Well, what does Paul mean it's a matter of equality? Well, he goes on. At the present time, your abundance is for their need, so that also their abundance might come to be for your need, so that you might become equal. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not lack, which is a quotation of the Israel and the manna, and how they go up and they gather a certain amount of manna according to how many people are in uh, each house. And there's a fundamental equality there in them receiving what they need. So this idea of equality is pretty important, too, to think about. Um, it's not an equality that God just creates straight out of the gate by making everybody the same or giving everybody the same amount of money. Right. God has given some more than others. And in different periods of time. Some people are in need and some people are prosperous. I think sometimes with our well-developed financial system, this is something we are more distant from. In the ancient world, famine might hit who knows where. And the, a, a good year today, you can't necessarily save that up, invest that in the stock market, right? And, a, you know, an IRA or something like that. It's like, we have a good harvest this year, which is great for this year, but it doesn't mean that you're still going to have food next year. And so there's this sense in which you're abundant now, you might not be tomorrow. Of course, that's still true for us. We, we have all this, these great financial technologies that help us avoid it, but we still have those moments when you're, you know, you may have been abundant, but now you're in need. Paul says that there's, it, it's, it's this design, a design of God's kingdom that these, in, these inequalities that exist uh, are supposed to be remedied through giving. Um, and so equality here is not everybody is like maybe starting out at the same place, but rather those who have more strength, those who have more power right now are going to give and some are going to receive. And at other times, in other ways, in other contexts, others are going to be strong and they're going to give. It's something, it's an idea that Paul elsewhere applies even beyond financial to like other kinds of gifting as well, that there's a sort of complementarity here, um, an equality that comes about by not by, you know, like in the body, not by everybody being an I, but by every member of the body having a specific function so that we need each other. And the need is important. We can't be independent. We experience our equality because we need to rely on each other to supply our needs. Um, so that clarifies, by the way, here that we're not just, there is a measure of prudence in what's going on. You know, we shouldn't be impoverishing ourselves um, like irresponsibly. But rather, we, we should be seeking to use our abundance to help those in need. And then when we should, you know, there'll be a time when we need them <laughs> and, and the relationship will, will go the other way. Paul continues right into the next chapter. Therefore, I thought it was necessary to exhort these brothers that they might go to you beforehand. He goes into some of the details in the, in the gap here. He goes into some of the details about who he's sending to collect and all that sort of thing. And he's talking about the people who he's sending. Uh, in order that they might go to you beforehand and prearrange the promise of your contribution, that this preparation might be like a blessing and not like an extortion. <laughs> Um, Paul wants, you know, again, the, the, the concern this be a free will offering. And for that, Paul, he thinks we need preparation. He wants to send them ahead of time. We do have the idea here of a promise that's later fulfilled. Um, and, uh, and again, the heart attitude is really important here. He doesn't want this to be a shakedown. He doesn't want this to be, you know, a guilt trip. Um, rather it is an encouragement so that it would be like a blessing. And he goes on to explain that. That is, the one who sows sparingly also reaps sparingly, and the one who sows blessedly will reap blessedly. We often translate this sows in abundance and will reap and it will reap in abundance, which isn't really wrong. But the idiom here specifically brings in the idea of, of blessing, like the one who, who sows uh, in a way that blesses, in other words, a lot, will receive in a way that blesses a lot. Um, each of you, as he has purposed in his heart, not with regret or from necessity, 
for God loves a cheerful giver. So joy as the attitude rather than regret, sadness, grief, even the word can be translated, and not necessity. So again, he said it wasn't a command, and now he says we shouldn't give from necessity as if it's something we have to. Rather, it's supposed to come in this spontaneous, free, cheerful way. He says, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace abound to you so that having every sufficiency in everything at every time, you might abound into every good work. Just as it is written, he scatters, he gives to the poor, his righteousness remains forever. And Psalm 102 is one of these portraits of the righteous man. And he quotes the verse about giving to the poor. Um, and so he points us back to God's ability to make grace abound in us and give every sufficiency. Um, and so, and, and so we're looking to, you know, he points us back as well. Like, you know, I think from the desire for a cheerful heart to the fact that God is behind it, you know, God is the one who makes this grace abound in us. It's not something even we can just gin up out of like, well, I, you know, out of compulsion or something like that. It's something that God has to give it has to be a gift, a work of God's Holy spirit. Um, and, 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 and we should probably pause here and say, this could be twisted into a prosperity gospel kind of way, right? If you give, um, you know, if, if you give now, God will re respond exactly four times. What a great way to get rich. Give to this televangelist. That's not really the idea we get if we're looking carefully at the whole thing. It's really clear here that many of the believers, in fact, some of the most faithful believers Paul is talking about are in poverty. They're in tribulation. They're going through it. Paul assumes that there'll be a time in the future that the people he's talking to and exhorting to give will themselves be in need and impoverished and need other people to give to them. So there's not the idea that like perpetual fantastic amounts of worldly wealth are available if you um, give appropriately. That's very far from uh, what Paul is talking about. However, he does encourage us not to look to our own resources, but look to God's ability to provide, which might be God's ability to provide in that God brings trials that impoverish you, but he also gives you the church, other believers who you can ask for help and provide for you. So I just want to make that footnote that like, we have to really separate some of these individual verses from the whole context of what Paul is saying and the whole vision that he has if we were going to have to take it in that kind of prosperity gospel sort of direction. Uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll leave it here with Paul, but now the one who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed and will increase the fruit of your righteousness. In everything you will be enriched into all simplicity, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God, because the service of this ministry is not only providing the needs of the saints, but is also abounding through many thanksgivings to God. Through the evidence of this service, they will glorify God because of the submission to your confession of the gospel of Christ and the simplicity of their participation in them and in all. And they will long for you in their prayers on your behalf on account of the surpassing grace of God to you. Thanks to God for this indescribable gift. Now, I want you to notice, just in keeping with that prosperity gospel point, how much the reward that we reap from giving is spiritual. <laughs> uh, you know, how little Paul's focus is, you know, if you give money, Paul, will, God will make you even richer materially, versus if you excel in the grace of giving, God will increase the fruit of your righteousness, like he will increase your, it's something that helps us grow into these, um, these fruits of the spirit that God has called us to. Um, and again, he points us back to, to, to God's provision, the one who provides seed. Again, echoes of David, anything we would give is something God has given to us first. The whole reason we have seed to sow in the first place is because God made the crop grow last year. Um, God is the one then who makes the seed grow, who multiplies it. And when we give, we are in some sense asking God to bless our giving to our spiritual growth. Um, and he talked about that. And so that this spiritual riches being enriched into all simplicity. There's that virtue again of like our hearts becoming whole um, in this in, um, entire devotion to God. And then that's going to produce thanksgiving to God. So thanksgiving is one of the benefits that we receive as we learn how to give. We become actually more thankful. 
Um, and he says, because the service of this ministry is not only providing the needs of the saints, but also abounding through many thanksgivings to God. So it's not just material need, but it produces the spiritual benefit of thanksgiving towards God. And then he says, because, and he goes on to explain that through the evidence of the service, they will glorify God. So the, pe the, the people on the receiving end also receive spiritual benefit and not just material benefit because they give thanks to God. Um, and it's interesting because of your submission, you know, we have this language of mutual submission elsewhere, like the sense that serving our brothers is, and sisters is this is submission, but it's submission to your confession of the gospel of Christ, a sense of which like you are putting yourself um, entirely under the words that you have said. It's not just words, it's something that you act on. And the simplicity of the participation in them and all, like this virtue of simplicity, which you display will encourage them. You know, previously Paul had talked about the giving of the Macedonians, the Achaeans being um, something that uh, produces fruit in them. And then your giving will be produced fruit in Jerusalem. There's like this wonderful positive feedback loop um, of fellowship here. And then it results in them praying for you. Like they're moved they, and long for you. It's like really strong language of desire. Um, it's in fact very strikingly strong language for something that is a platonic relationship, like the depth of this kind of Christian love here that expresses itself in they, them praying uh, for, for the church in Corinth um, on account of the surpassing grace of God to you. And like we have this God-centered focus that it never just becomes focused on the humans giving, but on how this is a picture of like, look at what God has done in producing this free gift that leads humans to glorify God and love each other, desire, long for each other more deeply and it be expressed in prayer. And Paul kind of sums it all up. You know, he's getting carried away in, in his Paul sort of way here. Thanks to God for his indescribable gift. You know, it ultimately all brings us back to God, thanking God for his indescribable, indescribable gift. So there's a lot there. Let me try to like draw just a big circle around some of the main points. New, what are the New Testament emphases here? I'd say, number one, where is your heart? And there's various different like virtues here that, that uh, and gifts of the fruits of the spirit to exemplify. One is honesty, that the giving is happening in an honest, authentic way. Simplicity, um, this kind of wholeness and integrity of heart that um, uh, is expressed when we genuinely give. Joy, that we experience joy in our, our giving when it's a free giving from the heart. And freedom, this sense of like that is something free. It's not necessity. It's not compulsion. Um, but it's a free expression of what, you know, of, uh, in response to God. Again, this is the language of the free will offering, which is very much not outside of the um, outside of the explicit commands is a way that we uh, rejoice in in who God is and what he's done for us. Just as importantly as participation with fellow believers and the idea of equality um, that uh, if I say I have a spiritual participation and, 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 and I have this deep theology of our union together in Christ, there is this necessary material expression to it. And that that expresses itself in a kind of equality, which is that we um, want the needs of everybody in the church to be provided for. And we consider that as, as important or maybe even more important than our own needs so that our property is at the disposal of others' needs. Um, it's grounded in Jesus becoming poor for us to make us wealthy. Um, this, uh, the, the fundamental gift that has been given in the gospel. Um, and it's God's work to make us abound in grace. Uh, it's something that's not, uh, that we can't just make happen on our own, but it's a sign of God's grace when he gives us the ability in our hearts to give in that sort of way. Okay, I wanted to address one question briefly that come, could come up in the context of all this, which is, should Christians tithe? Uh, I'm going to plug this book. It's an ebook. You can get it on Amazon. Full uh, disclosure, I did the electronic typesetting for this book, so I do get uh, a kickback for any copies that are sold. So just, you know, truth in advertising here. Um, but really quickly, let me give you, this is just a booklet. Get, you know, I'm trying to answer this question to Kristen's tithe. And the conclusion my dad comes to, which is one I agree with, is that really the tithe, the give 10% of your agricultural produce, is part and parcel of the Mosaic law. And so um, 
we don't really see it applying in the same way to believers under the new covenant. Um, but that rather we see kind of more the pattern of the free will offering uh, become the guiding principle for Christian giving. And so, I mean, you'll notice like Jesus tells the rich young ruler to give 100%. Zacchaeus gives 50%. It, it doesn't really seem like there's necessarily a specified percentage, um, but rather the New Testament focuses us much on what is the heart behind what you're giving. Now that's to say that you couldn't use 10% as like a handy guide, just that perhaps we shouldn't list it as a uh, compulsive sort of command. We'll notice how Paul actually specifically avoids giving, commanding them to give a percentage. Paul very well could have said, now you need to give 10%, but uh, here's some guidance on how you might want to give more for that. He doesn't even go there at all. Um, and so just anticipating that question, that would be my brief answer that we should see the tithe as fundamentally something together with the rest of the Mosaic law um, that uh, as like a civil ordinance that doesn't continue in the same way. Um, but uh, rather we should be reoriented towards principles of uh, freely and freely and cheerfully giving and seeking to excel in the grace of giving such as we find in Corinthians. But let me stop now. I'll, I'll you know, if you, if you want to hear more about that, this is a resource. I'm highly biased, obviously. I like my dad's book that I put a lot of work into typesetting electronically. But let me open it up for, for further questions or comments um, on any of the stuff we covered. Part of a Luke Acts is that uh, Jesus observing the uh, widow putting money into the treasury in the temple, is it not? What's your comment on that? It's a difficult passage um, as part of why, you know, in trying to look at time constraints, but I'll give you, here's why it's difficult. There's two interpretations of the passage. One is that this is a picture of uh, deeply motivated, like de uh, uh, deeply um, uh, uh, moving, act of giving where she gives away her last two mites and it's and she does what the although she's so much poorer than the rich young ruler she does what he fails to do and this is this wonderful picture of christian giving even beyond your means another take on it though um is that within the context of the temple being corrupt and jesus driving out the money changers that uh he actually is much more critical like that it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a much more ironic sort of thing um, where we're actually supposed to see it more as a critique of that system of, of actually the temple becoming something that's exploitative. And maybe we're not even supposed to emulate her, um, uh, her, her giving. Maybe we, we even are supposed to see it as maybe well-intentioned, but actually, you know, rather foolish and messed up. Um, it's a, you know, and then you, you can have a whole back and forth of those interpretations. I will say most early interpreters go for the, this is an example of Christian giving interpretation. Um, and I mean, I'm, if you ask me today, I maybe slightly favor that one. Um, but it clearly it's re related to what we have to do. I think it kind of like is a difficult passage because it has some of these dueling interpretations behind it of figuring out what is, what is Luke trying to say there? Jamie, because we're talking about uh, giving in the context of public worship, yeah, um, and this is this is clearly not the main, the main point or the most important thing. I, I appreciate what you said, but I I was kind of interested that during the pandemic, um, and we haven't we haven't been to worship, but my understanding is that there was a box or something in the in the foyer where people were bringing their um, offerings and putting them in, and I was kind of thinking it'd be neat if we continued that practice and then add maybe children or, or somebody uh, that the offering be that these, these people bring the box up front, you know, and rather than pass the plate uh, I, I, just because I think um, the visuals in worship matter, you know, they sort of set the tone and um, uh, I, I don't know. I've just kind of encourage any who are in, in, in a position to, to, uh, talk to session that, that that might be an interesting thing to continue 
And, and God's actually kind of given us an opportunity. You know, people might say, oh, we wouldn't get enough, you know, funds from that. But we've, we've operated for almost two years. And just wondered. We started passing the plate a yeah. month ago. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, scripture doesn't overspecify it. But of course, that is, uh, although, you know, the one example with a box is um, when uh, Levitical funds are being mismanaged and Joash, so Joash builds a box. So that like add to add some accountability is that, but that's, I mean, that's just an accountability <laughs> thing on Joe's part there to make sure that we're tracing where the money goes and nobody's misusing it, which also is, by the way, I didn't really cover it in this, but that's also like managing the funds well and not embezzling them is, is a theme in the Bible. But um, yeah, just because there's not a direct scriptural specification, well, that actually leads it up to like, we need to think wisely about like, what does best communicate what we mean to communicate. And I'm, I don't know. I, I don't know which is the best practice. The idea that we are coming as we're, we're giving or we're, we're passing it around and, and taking a specific moment in the service um, set us within the service to actually do that. And of course, that gives an opportunity for us to pray a prayer like David prayed over over the offering as well. Um, but um, I don't know. Does anybody else have opinions about <laughs> what are, what are the different advantages or disadvantages of passing the plate versus having a box? Or any other any other comments or questions? Okay, well, I'll go ahead and uh, close this in prayer, and we can head off to worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for Christ's work, that he became poor, that we might be made rich and given an identity as his sons and daughters. And we pray that you would help us to excel in this grace, uh, that uh, we would freely, willingly, joyfully give um, to supply the needs of others. We pray that you would make us conscious of those needs, um, that you would make our church one that's effective and knowledgeable in how we uh, see and find those needs. And we pray that you would help us to be blessed as we give to each other and that we would abound in that grace. And we pray that uh, we would remember to give you the credit and uh, look to you and that uh, the lo love for Jesus and uh, thanksgiving to you would abound among us as a community as we supply each other's needs. And uh, especially this week, as we come to worship you, we pray that you would bless our, our giving. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'll see you guys in worship. <laughs>